Hi, I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Ann Charles. I'm Keith Ghostland, and welcome to All Things LGBTQ. <coughs> this time we are taping on Wednesday, the 2nd of March, the day after town meeting day. We acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. And now I'm, I, I'm really hoping that Linda's got some good gossip. Well, I have a little bit, but the first item is gossip. Well, yeah, entertainment gossip. Well, so anyway, Colton Underwood, if we might remember who that is, was on The Bachelor Show, and he won't be a bachelor much longer, as he is now engaged to political strategist Jordan Brown. So, I have no, I have no comment. I don't either. <laughs> And interesting, Apple stands out as the only private business lob lobbying against Republican-backed Iowa bill that would ban transgender girls from competing in women's sports in school. So, good for Apple. Texas business community condemns Governor Abbott's transgender order, but they have stopped short of leaving the state. So what good is that, right? Mm -hmm. Uh a Florida man is arrested after he tried to cut the gay out of his brother. We'll have more about that later. Christian conservatives are outraged that Regu refers to a male firefighter as a mother. And just a mother, not a swear or anything, just a mother. Red Sox minor league leaguer is gone for calling LGBTQ people rapists and sodomites. Well, we'll have Come more on. of that if we get a chance. Um, it's 2002 and in Staten Island, uh, you still, if you're LGBTQ, cannot march in their parade. We'll have more about it's that. St. Patrick's Day Parade. Right. A 70-year-old pleads guilty to reportedly threatening to bomb LGBTQ people and to bombing LGBTQ events. The retired teacher, Robert Fehring, entered a guilty plea. Where was this? I have no idea. Conservatives in North Carolina freak out because teachers won't be able to access gender information I about thought, students anymore. Isn't I that great? I saw that. Um, brutal gay basher who was sentenced to life. Uh, Jess got recommended for parole. He's the uh, guy in the Navy. We'll have more about that. Um, in Maryville, California, a guidance counselor is arrested after leaving racist and homophobic voicemails. We'll talk about that. A 60-year-old gay man was tied up by his sadistic teenage um, neighbor who threatened to kill him. The police came. Uh, an Oklahoma judge is denying a mother parental rights because it, she isn't ge the gestational parent. We'll have more about that. Florida's HB 1557, which bans teachers from discussing LGBTQ people in class, has passed in the House. Oh. Students across the state are organizing, however to have a walkout next week to protest the attack on their fellow students. We'll have more on that when it, next week when they have the walkout. Hold, hold on to that thought for my second segment when I start talking about New Hampshire and what they may be up to. All right. And our, one of our favorites, Marjorie Taylor Greene, says transgender camp counselors should be beat into the ground. We'll have more of that. If you're it's beaten. Beat, beat. She said, well, you know, she said beat. Okay. So I'm just. She, she's quoting. I'm however, quoting. However bad the grammar <laughs> is, she's quoting. Uh, top attorney general in Oklahoma demands a book ban while he investigates of mice and men hmm. and other classics. John O'Connell says that books that are acceptable now, in this today, may not be acceptable in the future because they could be considered pornographic. 
He's reviewing 51 books, and he said he felt that he had to do this because he was receiving so many complaints. So, A black trans woman is awarded $1.5 million after she was wrongly arrested for jaywalking in Atlanta. Texas governor declares trans medical care as child abuse. Miss Universe Philippines has crowned its first LGBTQ winner. Oh, that's national, international. Know, that's I'm international, sorry. But I don't have it. Right. <laughs> Beatrice <laughs> Gomez broke, broke down barriers by claiming this title. Gay men seem to outperform straight men in nearly every academic measure. I saw that. We'll have more about that if we can. <laughs> Christian Union perpetuates a culture of homophobic Behavior at elite universities. We'll have more about that. Law professor and LGBTQ rights activist Joe Tom Easley dies at 81. He played a big role in an effort to fight Don't Ask, Don't Tell. He was a lawyer and taught in three different law schools. He is survived by his partner of 39 years, Peter Friedberg. And my last little story is... Josh Hawley backs Vicki Hartzler, the LGBT candidate who is running for a Senate race in Missouri. He so. backs the LGBTQ candidate? No, the LBT, no, the L, the anti-LGBT, oh. she's, <laughs> sorry, anti-LGBT candidate in the Missouri Senate. So there and you go. And Robert Fayring is from Long Island. Is he? Bayport, Long Island. How do you know? I just looked it up and he uh, oh. threatened the New York City Pride Parade. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, said terrible things about the Pulse nightclub massacre. Yeah, that he would, uh, he'd make it look like a cakewalk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, He's yeah. He's been busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Lovely, charming person. Shall I move yes, along? Yes, move along. All right. Um, let's start with Asia. Um, Singapore's top court dismisses an attempt to overturn a gay sex ban. And the reasoning is that it, it's unenforceable anyway, so we might as well keep it on the books. And of course, activists disagree. <laughs> but they think, grasping at straws, maybe they think, well, at least they said it's unenforceable, so I guess that's progress. So uh, now I have a picture of Ganga Nayak, a 49-year-old transgender candidate who has won a seat in Vellore in India. She uh, belongs to the province of Tamil Nadu. And the, I mean, this is a victory, but activists point out that she's been involved with this party for 20 years. So finally, she's won in office. So it's not rapid fire progress in India, one might argue. Uh, speaking of India, though, the National Medical Commission has forbidden conversion therapy. Good. Now, I have a <laughs> story about China. And, you know, I've been reporting on how all the LGBTQ voices are being silenced in the media. But now they've cropped up again on this YouTube channel called Billy Billy, and I'm sure that's not how you say it in Chinese. But anyway, it publishes 20-minute vlogs, which are short um, films focusing on LGBT people, mostly gay men. It's an extension of that boy love uh, trend that I've been talking about right. in China that all the young women are watching because TV is so bad. Um, but it's a, it started out as a niche streaming f platform for fans of anime, comics, and games. But now it's one of the biggest media portals, home to everything from documentaries and variety shows to all these boy love productions. Um, there are several key things. They're, they show coming out blogs. Um, a very popular one that was uploaded in 2019 garnered more than 2 million views and it's about this gay man who comes out to his father and then his father takes him to the 
hospital to see if it can be cured. And then he goes back to the hospital three times with his boyfriend to see if it be, could be cured. And this was very popular because they're talking about gay male stuff in the media. Uh, on the surface, uh, it seems sort of like coming out phenomena in the West. But the difference here is that it's much more communal and parental oriented because um, the U.S. or the U.S. or the West focuses on coming out stories as individual breakthroughs. But this involves the whole community uh, centering on the attitudes of parents and partners appear. And there are, of course, there's a commercial angle, but it's very popular. Now I'd like to go, if I may, to Azerbaijan, where bad things have happened. There's a picture before you now of LGBTQ activist and journalist Avaz Shikamadov Havzili, 24, who was found stabbed to death near Baku, which is the capital of the country. Um, his cousin was arrested for the killing. The Authorities say they got into a dispute, the cousin was drunk, but insiders say it was an honor killing. And the circumstance in Azerbaijan generally for LGBTQ people is pretty terrible. It's been voted, uh, rated number 49 on the Rainbow Bridge um, Index, which measures um, rights and atrocities in countries. Um, it, um, the only other thing about it is that honor killings, as I keep saying, are very widespread. And in Azerbaijan, they're covered by the media and the media kind of endorses them. So terrible news there. Uh, now I'd like to go to Australia. Bad news from Australia. This conservative Head of Australia, Scott Morrison, has now come out in favor of a controversial bill targeting trans athletes. It's called Save Women's Sports. They take it up around the world. I know it. And there's a particular Jeez. deplorable in the government who has, she's a, a transphobe, and she's presented this Save Women's Sports bill. Not Margaret Court. No, he says it's terrific, but... We must recall that he's a Pentecostal Christian. Um, he's previously supported a religious discrimination bill, um, which has been shelved. And activists are hopeful that this Save, the, Save Women's Sports Bill will meet the same fate. But Scott Wars, Morrison in Australia, someone to watch and distrust. Now I'd like to go, if I may, to North America, and I have a picture before you now of Guanajuato, Mexico's non-binary person's identity. So the non-binary person picture before you is Fausto Martinez, and he has finally gotten a non-binary um, third gender birth certificate. Birth certificate, exactly. He says. Uh, what is not named does not exist. Legal recognition establishes that non-binary people have rights. This is a great achievement. And he's the first person in Mexico <coughs> to get such a document. Good news there. Um, now let's go to the Cayman Islands. And I've got a picture before you of Chantel Day at the left and Vicki Baden Bush on the right. I just want to present them again because we've been looking at them for at least a year while they have tried to get some resolution um, on their same-sex marriage petition. And one year on, no decision from the Privy Council in the UK on the same-sex marriage case. So there they are again. I mean, you know, it's time. So my last um, story from North America includes a film clip from Canada. And before I talk about that, I want to apologize to the viewers. Last time I talked about Water Lilies, the Celine Shama film, and I told you it was on Netflix, and Lynn and I tried to get it. It was not on Netflix. Then we went to YouTube, and it's only in French on YouTube. 
with no subtitles. So the trailer is subtitled, but it's misleading, and I inadvertently misled you. So from now on, I'm checking Netflix before I uh, report. And I have checked Netflix about this story called On the Fringe of Wild. It's a Canadian film, and if I may, let me tell you the plot. It's in the early 2000s in a small northern Ontario town in Canada. Peter, a sensitive and shy teen, dreams of leaving his small northern Ontario town to pursue life as an artist. But his homophobic father <clears throat> intends to make him a man instead, uh. forcing him on a hunting trip one cold winter break. Tensions run high and Peter runs away. Lost, cold, and reaching his breaking point, Peter meets Jack, who's also desperate to escape his toxic family situation. A romance quickly develops between the two teenage boys as they hide away in a secluded cabin, discovering each other and themselves. But the world outside eventually pulls them back, and they're forced to face the circumstances they tried to flee, which will ultimately tear them apart. That's, I guess, a spoiler. But anyway, watch the clip. I get bullied. <laughs> by your dad? Yeah, by pretty much everyone. This man trip you're doing, it's not gonna make him any less gay. You're here to grow a pair. I don't want to. Did you make plans for the future? I thought I'd be dead by now. I just want him to be happy. Kids, you like your bunnies? Don't worry, I can assure you that this is garbage. He won't be happy like that. Stop. He will if we let him. Put the damn thing away or I'm gonna throw it out the window. Did your dad give you that bruise? <gasps> Why'd you want to kill yourself? Should we be talking about this? It's cold out. Yeah, I know. To your boyfriend. I thought I knew you. I thought you'd love me forever. I never loved you. He showed me that my life was worth living. Jack inspired all of these. Hold me. Why him? I was there for you. How is this okay? I'm not gonna let you die. Wow, that sounds sad. Sounds violent. It, the clip has seemed a little violent to me, but I don't think he kills the rabbit. So, yeah. Okay, All right. giving away more of the plot. <laughs> <laughs> well, they just saw it on the trailer. He's, you know, the father says, "Shoot the rabbit." Yeah. Um, so I have only Europe to go, but I have a lot of stuff there. So why don't we move to Keith? I'm I'm rooting for the rabbit. I'm rooting just, for the rabbit so too. You know. You know, I have been a vegetarian 46 years. And I thought she was about to do an Elmer Fudd imitation. We shoot the rabbit, but... So, as we transition from Black History Month to Women's History Month, this is this week's trivia, and they both got it first thing. So, it, so I, I, I've got hopes for y'all. She was the first black playwright and youngest American to win the New York Critics Circle Award, and she had the first play written by an African-American woman to be produced on Broadway and without hesitation. So as we were coming up, Linda and Ann saw on their Facebook account that Peter Jacobson from Vermont Cares is stepping down to pursue other interests. There, there were no other details, so we will be reaching out and reporting back. On a previous show, I talked a bit about three school board candidates in Milton. And yesterday being town meeting day, that's when municipalities would vote on both their council, school board, other elected officials. Well, apparently it wasn't just Milton. Arlington, Mills River, which is the community in Rutland where there's been so much controversy, St. Albans, Springfield, 
Kingdom East and coming up on March 22nd in Lake Region, they all had candidates running for the school board that put out rhetoric against critical race theory, against mask mandates, <coughs> putting out a lot of what we're seeing on the national level for the right-wing conspiracy of interest. None of them got elected. Yes. yes. And in most communities, they were at the bottom of the list for vote getters. Oh, thank heavens. So, but, okay, but still, it's one of those, uh, if you're really not looking, it would be easy to miss. And thinking that because we're here in Vermont that somehow it's not going to impact we're us. We're insulated, yeah. It's a little delusional, but... We gotta watch. Absolutely. So oh, looking at... such good news, though. I have oh, I know. Publicly. I, I, I was really pleased. Events. Rainbow Umbrella. You're, you're still discussing. We're in. You're, you know, we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Look at the Facebook page to see what they're discussing. Outright Vermont, March 31st. This is the Queer Youth Leadership Day at the State House. This is for queer and allied youth leaders to have their voices heard. And there are meetings that are scheduled with legislative leaders and talking with a panel of our out legislators. Queer Connect, Tuesday, March 15th, and this is a Zoom event. And think of you know the, the sapphic story hours. An evening with Dr. Stephanie Andrea Allen. <gasps> I want to, I'm just she is her to come on the show. I'm in correspondence with her. I love her work. She's going to read from her book, How to Dispatch a Human Stories and Suggestions. And this was the, this was the tag for the book. Um, it's an unapologetic, often humorous foray into the everyday magic that envelops black women's lives. The 11 stories in this collection are filled with characters who will entice and delight readers as they transverse the worlds around them yeah. with, a ma with a mix of fabulism, near future, and speculative fictions, Alan reminds us in exquisitely nuanced prose that the fantastical can be found amongst the ordinary. Uh -huh. And you can register via the Queer Connect Facebook page. Please do not go to the website Facebook page. May I add, this is a dynamic woman. She, I can tell you everything about her. I've been, um, I've been corresponding with her for months, asking her for an interview. And, um, um, Sorry, folks. <laughs> that's all right. Um, she is a professor at Bloomington. She got her PhD at Purdue, where I went, in Indiana. Um, and importantly, I've read, uh, she edited a collection of short stories called Les Talk with another, with a colleague, and I read her collection of short stories, Failure to Communicate. And she's really good, and importantly, she's a founder of Black Lesbian Feminist Press, which is doing wonderful work and bringing out Jewel Gomez's uh, June collection of poems. So look for her on our show. I'll have to email her again. And, and hopefully, while we were having that discourse, Zach put up the poster from Queer Connect promoting the event. So, so you'll get to see a picture of her. Can I say one more thing? When I interviewed, <laughs> too bad. <laughs> when I interviewed Can Penny, we stop you? <laughs> when I interviewed Penny Mickleberry, she came up and Penny said, Steph S. Andrea Allen is a force of nature. So tune into that and. We'll keep you posted on whether she can join us, too. And, and if you have another day open with nothing going on, the Pride Center is partnering with Bolton Valley Resort for a queer skiing day. And it's going to be on Tuesday, March 15th, from 4 in the afternoon till 10 at night. Go on to the Pride Center site so you can get discounts on the tickets, access to events, Good. more information about it. Babes in Bethel, uh -huh. who we're still waiting for them to accept our invitation for an interview. Saturday, March 19th, they're doing a queer dance, which Zach's going to put up the poster. Uh -huh. Come dance the night away. This is their queer DJs. 
that they were telling us about that they've been trying to get together, give them a form, a little promotion. It's a $5 cover, 8 o'clock until midnight. I hope they have disco. I'm not going there and you can't make me, but <laughs> if, if you go to these events and it kind of sort of feels like maybe you're not all that alone, the Williams Institute from the University of California, Los Angeles says Vermont has the seventh highest rate of LGBTQ yeah. people per capita in the country, and we have the highest rate of same-sex couples. Uh, who knew? But apparently, <laughs> that's predominantly our youth. The older generation, we're less represented. Who, I'm, I'm, we're, we're shy. What can I tell you? Um, very quickly, there is a new candidate who has announced they're interested in running for the Senate seat from Vermont. And this is Christina Nolan, whose Pictures Act we'll be putting up. And this came up last time. Linda mentioned no, it. We, oh, we, we took not, out the whole we thing? Did not, we did not oh, okay. discuss it last time. We jumped but the gun. <laughs> it's, it's okay. <laughs> but what she is the former federal prosecutor for, for Vermont, her her statement is, although she is a Republican, she has promised a fresh perspective and argued that instead of looking at the R next to her name on the ballot, Vermont should trust her as an independent thinker willing to break with her party and to work across the aisle. And this, this was the, the part of her bio that got my attention. She calls herself an environmentalist who believes in climate change and said, as a gay woman who cares a great deal about marriage equality and gay rights, she said she would break with her party if it meant getting a deal on paid family leave. And if you go onto her campaign website, it does include Jill, her domestic partner of 16 years, and also her beloved orange cat, Hank Thomas Nolan. So with that... Well, I have I, another comment, if I may. In the coverage of her um, candidacy that I've read so far, it seems like Vermonters are mostly afraid of upsetting the balance of the Senate. Yeah. Right. So that may be well, working and, and against also it her. Was, I'm sorry. Also, it was interesting that tagged onto her announcement, the Victory Fund says there are 96 openly LGBTQ plus congressional candidates with active campaigns as of February 21st. That's a 16% increase over the 2020 election. Have they endorsed her, do you know? I did not see where she has specifically been endorsed yet. It's early. Exactly. Okay, Linda. Very interesting candidate. It would be interesting to see how that unfolds. Um, okay, so there was, a, there was a Florida man who was arrested after he tried to cut the gay out of his brother. Uh, I guess this man had been acting a little strangely before this violent incident, but police arrested the man when someone called about a disturbance between the two of them. Uh, the brother threatened his brother while sharpening a large knife in the kitchen. Um, when the other brother tried to leave, he was forced back into the house. The police has, have registered the brother. I know the brother and the brother. <laughs> and uh, he's been charged with assault. So, so he stabbed his brother? Or no, he? he threatened to stab his brother. and His brother left, and then the, somebody called the police. The police came, and, you know, the brother's okay, but the other brother's arrested for assault. Okay. Or attempted assault or whatever. And my beloved Red Sox leaguer is gone for calling LGBTQ people rapists and sodomites. Brett Netzler, the dismissed player, wants you to know that he is also a racist, in case you missed it. He said that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Apparently, he liked tweeting his, uh, his opinions online. However, now, of course, if you try to find them, they're not there. Um, 
The 25-year-old player directed a lot of his comments to Chaim Bloom, the Red Sox chief officer, who he called an embarrassment to any Torah, Torah following Jew, criticizing him for supporting LGBTQ people and Black Lives Matter people. Oh. Oh. He's gone. Okay, now we're in Staten Island, and it's St. Patrick's Day. And you can't march if you're LGBTQ people uh, because it says on the application that the parade does not allow the promotion of sexual identification uh, and you can't have any um, gay agenda. It also states that you can't march if your views do not stand in any way in opposition to the teachings of the Catholic Church. This, there was a 20-year battle over LGBT participation in New York City, but their policy changed in 2014. But in 2020, Miss Staten Island was banned from marching because she was bisexual. Now, did Boston change Boston their again, okay. yeah. Yeah, although that was a battle also. Brutal gay basher who was sentenced to life just got recommended for parole. You know, and, and his family talked about how, you know, he comes up for parole every two years and how they just are constantly bring, being brought back to what happened. And it's just horrible. Uh, so almost 30 years to the day, um, he killed a gay man and said he'd do it again. And now Terry Helvey could walk free. He was a former Navy airman and killed fellow sailor Alan Schindler in 1992. After the murder, the Navy tried to cover it up. Yeah. Um, he went to um, his uh, naval officials. They didn't do anything to protect him. Um, and... Uh, he asked for help from his commanding officers, but he never got any. And so this man is up for parole. Who asked for help? The victim? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So in Maryland, in Maryville, California, a guidance counselor is arrested after leaving racist and homophobic voicemails. He was apparently upset because his daughter didn't get a good position on a softball team. Uh, you know, this is, okay. you know, you read this and you think, he left messages for two softball coaches and police said they found a loaded handgun in his car when he was arrested. I mean, really, you know, you're. In uh, Oklahoma, judges denying a mother parental rights a lesbian couple filed for divorce in 2021, and on the uh, mom and one of the moms, of course, is fighting for parental rights because she is not the biological mother. And so the judge said, you know, well, you're not the biological mother, and you don't have any rights here, and so, you know, this case is over, even though the other woman is listed on the child's birth certificate. So. That's Oklahoma. And then we have Marjorie Taylor Greene. Hmm? Says, trans camp counselors should be beat, beat, I'm quoting, uh -huh. into the ground. Marjorie Taylor Greene is a Republican legislator from Georgia, in case you didn't know. I'm trying to forget. <laughs> she called for violence in response to several non-binary camp counselors who may have slept in the same cabin as fifth grade girls at a three-day science camp in California. She feels this is straight up evil. Mm. You can't make these things up. I know. I... <laughs> okay, so we heard about gay men, although lesbian, Gay, men's out, gay men outperform straight men in nearly every academic measure. However, lesbians don't seem to fare as well. 
Did you read that? Yeah. Professor Charles, do you have a rebuttal? I do not have the moment. They didn't say why. <laughs> okay, so then there's this Christian Union um, group, uh, and they're homophobic and elite, and they, they, they're moving into um, elite universities. Matt Bennett founded the organization in 2002 to fight what he saw as a secularization of top universities, and he wanted to raise up a generation of, of global leaders with Christian values. The first ministry program was at Princeton. That was his first, the first place it was established. And now it is at all Ivy League schools. The group has a long history of homophobia. So. And this is a common thing. I mean, the right wing has been trying to been railing against I know. secularization yeah. in the academy for years. Left wing leanings. Okay, let's see. And I think that's probably it for me, Anne. I believe. Let me see. Let me just make sure. Yeah, that's it for me. I'm I'm I've done my job. Well, let me pick up uh your Staten Island story, if I may, to okay. make an announcement. Um, a friend of the show who's been interviewed, Devorah Zipkin, um, has a 10-minute play called Sylvie and Gracie Get Married, which is part of the Scenes from Staten Island series. Um, it's the uh, Scenes from the Staten Island Ferry 2022, produced by Sundog Productions, and it's going to be shown in Staten Island, but also on um, March 5th at 8 p.m. You can stream it. So uh, look for Sundog Theater production, and you can see Devorah's play. Okay. <laughs> Scenes from the Staten Island Ferry, what a hoot. Okay, uh, <laughs> let's go to more sober material from, I have, uh, from Europe. Um, we know what's going on in Ukraine. A warlord who persecuted gay Chechens was killed in Ukraine fighting um, in the airport. His name was Mag Maganoed Tushayev, uh, and he was head of the 141 motor mo Motorized Regiment of the Chechen National Guard, and he spearheaded all the harassment and torture and detainment and disappearances of gay men in Chechnya. So he's been killed. Um, he was sent to Ukraine and was killed at an international cargo airport. So I was going to show you his picture, but you know, why? There was a picture of him with uh, the head of Chechnya, who you know has organized this whole, who's the head of the whole that whole. Purge I think that's still a lot going of protesting on. Protesting by LGBTQ people in um, the Ukraine. Yes, and I have two um, accounts that I'd like to share with you. The first is accompanied by a picture. This is Olena Shevchenko, and she founded in 2008 Insight, a Ukrainian LGBTQ group. Uh, she lives in Kiev. Um, they have 11 branches in regions located in eastern, lo including in eastern Ukraine. Um, and when the Russians invaded, they started to collect the names of those who must be relocated immediately. Um, she says that um, when Russia invaded Crimea and annexed it in 2014, um, people fled and she established a, cel a shelter um, for LGBTQ people who were internally placed, displaced, who left Crimea, and she established this shelter in Kyiv in 2014. And now they're doing the best they can, but she says um, people are get in touch with her and saying, you know, what are you going to do? We're doing what we can do now providing psychological support to people, opening a hotline for consultations, and asking international communities to somehow help us. But it seems these instruments don't work anymore, 
in a world where we must fight this stupid war. This is a quote from her. In recent days, our international partners have been writing to me almost every minute, many of them asking if we have a crisis plan in place, and if not, when, we will, when will we develop it? We want to tell everyone again, what, we, we plan, what plan can work in the event of full-scale invasion? We do not have any planes to take people to a safe place. In any case, we remain to defend ourselves and our country and will continue to help people. Our activists in the LGBTQI plus communities are staying and keeping working, providing support for the most marginalized ones. Honestly, I don't know how long we will be able to resist, but we will do our best for sure. Now, I'd like to follow that account with um, some information from a transgender woman named Z Famelu, who is 31. Uh, she was born and raised in Crimea. Um, she uh, lives in Kiev now, which is, we know, the capital city that's been under siege for a week. She's running out of food and hasn't left her house. She was previously a popular contestant on the Ukrainian singing competition show Star Factory. For days, she had to keep the lights off in her apartment and keep the windows closed. She lives alone. Her friends have all left the city. Um, for years, transgender people in Ukraine wanted to be legal, who wanted to be legally recognized had a long list of steps they had to go through to do so. According to Human Rights Watch, the government mandated that transgender people undergo extensive psychiatric observation um, and to get gender reassignment surgery, they had to have legal documents that aligned with their gender. Legislation was, was introduced in 2017 to lessen the process, um, but it would still require transgender Ukrainians to undergo outpatient psychiatric examinations, and uh, there's no indication that the legislation was ever implemented. I didn't want to go through that. This is like humiliating for the world, she said. I decided to keep my passport, keep mail in my passport, and now I cannot leave the country. Um, in Russia, LGBTQ people are persecuted. Another activist said, uh, if we imagine that Russia occupies all of Ukraine or just a big part of the country, they won't allow us to exist peacefully and to fight for our rights as we are now able to do in Ukraine. Um, Famulu, Famelu's parents still live in Crimea, and they think the whole thing is made up, that Ukrainians are making it up. They've been so brainwashed by the Rus Russian government. Um, so among the list of 49 European countries, um, Ukraine is 49th for its overall treatment of LGBTQ people, but it would be worse under Russia. So now that I've given this long preface, Let's see a clip of Z Famelu. Sometimes we think it's just all a dream that we stuck in, inside some kind of a video game because you just, uh, you live uh, in a quiet society and then you hear bombings and then you wake up to the sound of bombings. I don't want to go outside. I'm literally scared for my life. All my friends left the city. My neighbors left my floor and I think my building. This is not a very rainbow friendly place. So lives for trans people are very bleak here.
if you have male gender in your passport, they will not uh, let you go abroad. They will not uh, uh, let you through. A war within a war, truly, truly. Every noise from outside is a warning sign. It was hell living as a trans person in, Ky in Kyiv in Ukraine. We feel invisible, truly. Like we're not people, like we're not humans. It's truly how we feel. Such a sad thing, and it's right awful. outside the city now. I just can't imagine. I mean, I, it's unfathomable. <coughs> and, and we, you know, as you said in the story, those of us who are living in safety reach out saying, okay, what, what is your exit? What is your safety plan? Well, my safety plan is to pull up a gun pointed at the person who is trying to shoot me and to defend myself. It, it, we cannot imagine. And then there's the, you want to do something. How do I reach out? How do I give support? And there's really no way in right now what I'm thinking in terms of is like the um, Rainbow Railroad, mm -hmm. that when the conflict starts easing down, how do we support it? How do we get, get priority people for people mm -hmm. and refugee status who identify as LGBTQ+, plus, et cetera? And you know that, that, that if, they, if, if Poland <coughs> knows that they're LGBTQ people, they're not going to be that welcoming either. As we keep hearing about Poland, <coughs> but, yeah. you know? Okay. Is it is it to me now? It is. Yeah, you leave me on that up note. I know. So I I'm going to go to a happier place. Okay. Because Zach's going to put up a picture of Maura Healy. And why you should care about this, why we should care about this, is she's the Massachusetts Attorney General. Yeah. She was the first openly LGBTQ plus elected Attorney General in the U.S. She's now running for Massachusetts governor. Uh -huh. Yes. So, and Massachusetts, I don't think has ever had a woman governor. Yes, it did. The one that stepped in. No, that was a mayor of Boston. Can you think of? We one? will do. We will do some research. I That's don't right. think there's been one woman. But governor. In I was going to say when Maura gets elected, she will be one of only three openly LGBTQ plus, plus governors in the country. Uh -huh. so, and looking at first, the picture Zach's putting up is Governor Scott's nomination to fill Beth Robinson's vacant seat on the Vermont Supreme Court. This is Nancy Wapples. Mm -hmm. She will be the first woman of color on Vermont Supreme Court. Do we know anything about her? Her parents were refugees from mainland China. Okay. And she grew up in New York. Uh -huh. She didn't speak English until she was nine years old. You know, she has been on the Superior Court here in Vermont for a while. Do we know what her while. politics are at all? Um, you, if you're going for a Supreme Court seat, politics are not the factor. Well, they're not supposed, supposed to be, be non-partisan. You know. non yeah. So... But what Governor Scott was saying, that this was in the tradition of Beth Robinson and other appointees to the court. Okay. So, and he appointed this the day before Joe Biden did his Supreme Court nomination. <laughs> Sage Maine, who, you know, they're sort of there over our shoulder. I'm getting phone calls from them. I had attended a conference sponsored by them. They've decided that... It's been a while since LGBTQ plus elders have been together, have been able to show support for each other. So they are literally calling everyone who has ever attended an event and say, how are you doing? Anything we can do for you. So I was thinking this could be a follow-up of, so what did you hear? 
what were the concerns of LGBTQ plus elders? And part of the focus was, you know, have you had your vaccinations? Have you had your booster? You know, do you have your in-home kits? Do you know where you can get testing? Those kinds of services. So New Hampshire, a, posit a positive and then a sort of, how did I miss this? Their House of Representatives just passed a bill that would ban the use of a trans gay panic defense. And it passed by a 20, uh, 223 to 18 vote. Oh, well, that's good. Well, one of the things that I keep forgetting about New Hampshire <coughs> is they're a trifecta now in the sense that both the governor and both chambers of their legislature are controlled by the same party, which might be Republican. Right. Yeah. So the fact that this bill is advancing means there's Republicans supporting this. Yeah. But I think they're do, the old fashioned Republicans maybe the old no, I'm gonna take it right away. And okay. let me tell no well no and let me <laughs> tell you why. And as I was reading the most recent announcement that I got from GLAD in Boston, I was reading a suit that they have filed and said, how did I miss this? Last year, last summer, when they were concluding their session, they tried to pass a bill that would ban inclusion of critical race theory, discussions of gender, gender identities, sexual orientation in school curriculum, and it failed. But they didn't stop. The people who were the proponents of that bill put an amendment on their budget bill about divisive concepts. Mm -hmm. So when you voted on the budget, you voted on this amendment, and New Hampshire schools can now not engage in any conversation about race, gender, oh. gender identity, oh. sexual orientation, or disability oh. in a classroom. Now, GLAD is working with a number of other um, legal wow. entities, such as the ACLU, the NEA, advocacy groups, to challenge this. Um, and as part of their argument, they're saying that this law, because it's part of the budget, it got voted on its law now, infringes on an educator's voices under the 14th Amendment and prevents students from having an open and complete dialogue mm -hmm about critical topics while it harms students with historically marginalized identity and creates a climate of fear that denies all students the freedom to learn. I mean, what's so, skullduggery to put it in the budget? It, well, and from, from they having- They do that a lot, don't they? They do it in the, in the national government too. They add these riders on to the end. Well, and, and from having been involved in this process here in Vermont, in the final days of a legislative session, there are lots of amendments, there's lots of pushes to get things through, there is a rush to adjournment, and sometimes you can overlook. You're sure. What, and one of the comments that about the crit critiquing this particular amendment is that the, va the language was vague enough that you might miss what was really happening. So, on our next show, I'm going to talk about two Supreme Court actions. One is they declined to take up an appeal from a college in, in Massachusetts where it was an educator who said that they were denied tenure because they were promoting LGBTQ plus issues. It was a religious school, but what the lower court decided was you're not in a you are not teaching a religion course therefore that sort of you have to be following the tenets of the faith does not apply however justice alito has said i'm not too sure they understand that so be waiting um, and the other is and we'll talk about definitely talk about it in more detail the supreme court is going to take up a challenge to, and I, and I can't believe this, it, it just staggers my mind, 
the Indian Child Welfare Act of 1978, which says if you are placing a child who is indigenous, it should be kept within their indigenous community. And the states of Texas, Louisiana, and Indiana are challenging it, saying, but it creates a child custody regime and is designed to make adoption and fostering of Indian children by non-Indian families the last resort. So despite our history of taking indigenous children, they think that white should have a priority for placement. Mm -hmm. So do we have any more news before I go to trivia? <coughs> well, there was a She's... woman called Jane Swift, apparently. But she really wasn't governor. She was co-governor. Oh, Massachusetts, this is. Yeah, she was co-governor for a period of time. I didn't have a chance to read the whole thing, but... Uh, she wasn't actually elected. She was in the Senate, the Massachusetts State Senate. But I, I can't quite tell, but it said she was co-governor with this other governor who, maybe she was lieutenant governor and he left and then she was governor for a few years, but I don't think she was elected. Interim governor before Romney. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of sticky messy yeah yeah so i don't think she was really elected governor i think she was like an interim co-governor or something it would, it would kind of support so, that mass hole process yeah he and i were born on the same day same year i have no comment because <laughs> we because we have the better of the twins <laughs> I like he's my evil twin i always put him up on my birthday so anyway, I suppose we have a trivia question. Yeah, I yes. hope so. I hope so. <laughs> First black playwright and youngest American to win a New York Critics Circle Award. First play written by an African American woman to be produced on Broadway. And it was? Lorraine Hansberry. Yes. And the play was? Raisin, Raisin in, in the, the Sun. Sun. And I will resist the impulse to recite some of the key speeches, but one of them said, uh, the mother says to the son, to her daughter who's trashing the son, measure him right, child, measure him right. Take into account everything he's gone through before you judge him. Oh. Okay, so with that. Okay, I think we should say resist. <laughs>